Good morning. I enjoyed that. Um, my daughter, my uh, granddaughter. I'm either too loud or not loud enough. <laughs> okay. Um, one of my granddaughters is learning to play the guitar. And I'm, I really marvel at people who can play musical instruments. Um, one of my former pastors, paid, he played the organ. And he played the one that had the, what is it you call under it? The steps. Or, yeah, he could sit there and move his feet and play. That's, to me, that's genius. I think it's wonderful. Thank you for that. Um, I like, uh, that's the box guitar, right? Is it, this is still not, I don't know the difference. Uh, I like that kind of uh, guitar and music. Um, I got here this morning and Pat said, good morning. I said, you're just glad that I'm not late. <laughs> I always enjoy coming to your church. I love your physical grounds, the campus. It's just beautiful. I think Henry David Thoreau would have gotten a ball out of this place. I think he really would have enjoyed it. Um, so this morning, I, I want to, first I want to share, uh, related to the topic, God never shuts up, and God never stops talking. I have a friend who is a Yale graduate and a Lutheran pastor. He's a brilliant man. And at times when I put posts on Facebook, he will respond to them. And of course, my little intellect immediately goes, oh, good, there's Russell again. Okay, so. Posted, posted something uh, last night, and uh, we, we were going back and forth, back and forth, and my ego got involved. And uh, he said, well, perhaps you would like to give me your definition of this particular thing. And I said, perhaps you would like to drop this matter because I see no value in the dialogue. That was nothing but my ego. And I was troubled by that. Uh, I couldn't go to sleep right away. And I got up this morning and I sent him an apology. I said, um, it, it was not needful for me to do that. That was rude and, and, and insensitive. Uh, because he actually complimented me, but I was so caught up uh, with the ego thing that I didn't even give that much attention. And he responded to me with such a beautiful statement. It's on my phone. I intended to bring it in, but I'll just give you sort of the, the crux of it. Uh, he said, I too was troubled and uh, could not sleep very well. But then after I had responded to him in love. He said, I see that you have decided to embrace unconditional love. And he said, that is truly the narrow pathway. And I find myself from time to time stepping away from that. I think he played me a very high compliment. And we engaged in dialogue a little bit more this morning. And he wrote me such a beautiful statement in response. And I said that to say that I believe all of us have within us a kind of still, small voice that speaks to us when we do things or say things that are not true to our nature. And when I, was, when I, I, got, I felt relieved... I know all of us have had those experiences where we've said things to people or done things and we were restless about it. And sometimes we're very pretentious. We, we act like, oh, it doesn't bother me. It doesn't matter. I don't care. But there's something within us that says, no, that's, that's not how you want to be. That's not the way you want to respond. And I think I enriched our friendship as a result of coming to terms with my own voice that said to me that's not the way you should respond because he's a wonderful human being he's brilliant 
And that's why sometimes when I post things and he starts responding, I'm like, oh boy, here comes Russell again. Uh, but we have maintained that friendship over the years, and uh, I appreciate it. And one of the things I finally said to him this morning is, I am so grateful for you being you. Okay? So this morning I want to talk with you about something that I've come to believe in what the theologians call my existential journey uh, on earth. And it is that I believe that God does communicate with us. And I want to talk this morning about how I believe God communicates with us, to whom God communicates, and when God communicates. Or if you choose to call it the primal essence or the source of all things, because in a cause and effect universe, there's a cause for every effect. If you want to call it the super cause or the stem cell of everything in existence or the shape shifter, it's up to you. It is what it is. And I believe that we are communicated with on a regular basis. I believe God never shuts up. And I believe that we, as the effect of some great cause, are connected and in touch with our source. And our source is in touch with us. I believe that this genesis of our beginning, the Creator, is the sum total of all of its individual parts like an immeasurable cosmic sea with trillions upon trillions of waves. It is not talking but communicating with its body unceasingly. The Apostle Paul talked about this when he used the analogy of the body of Christ. And I believe he was onto something. I believe he had great insight. But I believe it goes beyond the borders of any particular religion. I believe that all of us are part of some larger celestial body. And I don't mean some amorphous deity that has hands and feet and arms like we do. But that which is responsible for all things. I believe that each expression or individuation or incarnation is intertwined inextricably to this source. All of existence, every particle of life, seen and unseen, is what I believe is a single entity. And a lot of what I share with you comes as a result of being a member of uh, Neil Donald Walsh's community, the one who wrote many years ago, Conversations with God. In that community, I found my truth and my inner peace and a real guide for my life. And I share with you my truth this morning because I believe each soul walks its own path. And when we grow up as a species, we will be able to say, my way is not the only way. It is but another way. And I also believe that all truth is parallel, no matter where it comes from. I want to share this with you. Uh, it was lying on my table, and I almost threw it away because I said, oh, there's so much stuff on my table, I need to get rid of it. It is the golden rule in sayings from around the world. The Baha'i faith says, hurt not others in ways that you yourself would find hurtful. Buddhism says, and as you would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. Christianity, do not to others what you do not want them to do to you. Confucianism, do not to others what would cause pain if done to you. Hinduism, none of you believes, truly believes, until he wishes for his brother and sister what he wishes for himself. In Islam, it says, that's what, that, that was the Islamic one, and then in Judaism, it says, thou should love thy neighbor as thyself. Regard your neighbor's gain as your own gain. 
and your neighbor's loss is your own loss. And it goes on and on because we find these universal principles in most religions. And I believe that speaks to the topic this morning that God never shuts up. That God speaks to us in multiple ways and has spoken to us down through the generations and continues to communicate with us. I believe that the source of our existence is sentient, that it is aware of itself, because we are aware of ourselves. We're sentient. To me, it's logical to think that if we're sentient, then the source must also be sentient. But I don't believe that our source is the God of our mythologies. Again, I hear Shakespeare saying, there are more things in heaven and earth, the ratio, than are dreamt of in your philosophies. Which says to me that we have our cosmologies and theologies and our mythologies, and we embrace them. But is it possible, just possible, that there are things about ourselves and about life we do not understand, the understanding of which would change everything. Is it possible that with all of the beauty and power of our cosmologies and theologies that the data was limited? That there's more to it than we already know? We have a tendency to think that God does speak and has spoken has spoken down through the generations through these books we have, our sacred texts. I also believe this, and I'll talk a little bit more about that statement, that there are trillions of other singularized entities in our vast universe. And like the people of Columbus Day who said the earth was flat, on this beautiful but tiny blue dot where we exist, we have a tendency to think that we have a grasp of things that we may not. And one of the bases of scientific inquiry is that you never embrace first assumptions, that you test and test and test and inquire. Because most of us at this stage in human evolution, understand that the earth is not flat. We understand that our solar system is not geocentric, but heliocentric. We are one of a number of planets that revolve around the sun. The sun does not revolve around us. Now it's interesting that we still have some human beings on the planet who insist that it is still flat and that the sun still revolves around it. So there will always be some of us who don't embrace even uh, the, the latest and most expansive ideas about things, but each soul walks its own path. And uh, if you want to believe, uh, like Linus from Peanuts, that you can on Halloween sit in the pumpkin field and the great pumpkin will come, then that is your choice. And it's not to make fun of it as much as to help us understand that we are a very young species. We're seedlings. And Einstein said this, he said, the more I understand, the more I realize I don't understand. George Washington Carver said, he prayed a prayer one day and said, God, show me the mysteries of the universe. And God's response to him was, I'll show you the mysteries of the peanut, and that'll be enough to keep you busy for a lifetime. <laughs> I believe that we are never disconnected from this source because it is the source of all things. And we've heard the expression souls. And I believe that's an acronym for singular outpourings of universal life. That is what each of us is. We're singularized outpourings. If you've ever stood on the shore of an ocean and looked out at its waves, 
Every wave contains the ingredients of the ocean, but they are not the wave by themselves. I mean, the ocean by themselves. The ocean is the sum total of those waves. And as they rise and fall, I think that is a parallel to what we call life and death. From this cosmic ocean, we rise out in singularized form. And then we recede back into that cosmic ocean during the process of what we call death. And we call it death, but science tells us that we're made of energy, and energy can neither be created nor destroyed. It can take on different forms, but it doesn't die. I think although we call it death, it is a necessary thing because we live in a relative realm. And in the absence of that which is not, that which is is not. What do you mean by that, sir? And it's one of Neil Donald Walsh's statements. What I mean by that is you cannot know cold where there is no hot. We cannot know up where there is no down. We cannot know, uh, a young person said to me one night, we were discussing this relativity thing, and he said, what about anti-gravity? I said, you can't have anti-gravity where there is no gravity. It's all relative. And I believe that our source has individuated itself and variegated itself in trillions of ways throughout the universe. And if there's a multiverse, or there are multiverses rather, it is still from this one entity that I believe is all things. There's the one thing that is all things that expresses itself in multiple forms. We call God omnipresent, omniscient, and omnipotent. And I do believe that our source is that because it is the source of all things and that it has unlimited ways of communicating with us. So how does God communicate? In immeasurable ways. We've been taught that there's verbal and nonverbal communication. We've also learned through scientific inquiry that whales have a way of communicating with each other, or dolphins rather, that's nonverbal. And if a dolphin can communicate with another dolphin in a nonverbal way, why would we think that the source of our existence is limited in ways that it can communicate with us? Our so-called sacred manuscripts are often embraced as the most authentic and authoritative way that we have been talked to by God. These ancient books are relied upon and looked to for guidance and the way in which we have been spoken to. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I think as human beings we have to get to a place where we're willing to at least expand our consciousness to the point of realizing that we don't know everything. That we are not omniscient. We are not omnipotent. We are singularities of a singularity. And then when we talk about these books, which book is it? Is it the Torah? Is it the Mishnah? of the Talmud? Is it the Bhagavad Gita? The Rig Veda? Brahmanas? Upanishads? Mala Bahara and the Ramayana? I might have sort of mispronounced that. I should put my glasses on. I left them in that case. Is it the Tantras? The Tao Te Ching? The Buddha Dharma? Is it the master of humanism, Husinon? Is it, you get my point. All of these different sacred books embraced by different cultures, and in each culture we insist that our book is the book. Our truth is the truth. Rather than saying our truth is our truth. It is but a way, not the only way. But human beings have not evolved to the place where we can say 
Yes. And I just read to you a list of quotes that are found throughout the community of religion. And they're very much the same. And we will say in a heartbeat, yeah, but the Bible is the word of God. Okay, so that is to suggest that there's truth found no other place. And not only that, our ancient books which contain much rich wisdom that has guided us and through our misinterpretation, I believe, has misguided us. Some of our theologies have done more to separate us from each other than to bring us together. And not only that, but words are not necessarily the best way to communicate. Why? Let's talk about words. Words are utterances, noises that stand for feelings, thoughts, and experiences. They are symbols, signs, and sinews. They're not truth. They're not the real thing. They are open to interpretation, often misunderstood. Add to that the absence of original or authentic oral transmissions and manuscripts. They are translations. In the Christian faith, there have been these synods where they've met, and it's usually men who are arguing and fighting over what should be included in the canon and what should not be included. Books were put in and then books were taken out. Things were deleted. Things were added. So words are not the most reliable way to communicate truth. I believe that our sentient source uses words as a last resort. They are, in fact, the least reliable mode of communication from our source. Additionally, we've come to embrace the thought that God has a select group that God communicates with. And it is heresy to even think or assert other than that. One thing is certain. Many of us believe that God has spoken through our books, the old books, but God forbid that there be any new insights or new writings. Because, and I've, I've had people say things to me like, well, I read the King James Version, and that's the only version I read. That is my Bible. And our scholars tell us that the King James Version, re relative to the Christian faith, is one of the least reliable sources of research and authenticity. In view of the fact that there's both verbal and nonverbal communication, in view of the fact that our scientific inquiry has revealed that other sentient beings communicate nonverbally, we have to at least consider that maybe our source communicates in other words, in other ways. Well, I beg to differ that. God only communicates with words and that God has only communicated in our old books. Have you ever had a sense of being inspired? Have you ever had something you call serendipity? Have you ever had something you call deja vu? Have you ever suddenly realized something that you had pondered at one point and it becomes clear to you? I believe God does indeed communicate with us, all of us, in a myriad of ways. The real question is, who's paying attention? Our source has never ceased to communicate with its interconnected expressions. I can hear Dr. King say again, we're all tied together in a single garment of destiny, bound by an inescapable network of mutuality. That was a statement that talked about the interconnectivity of life, of all of it. Words can help us understand something, but there are feelings, thoughts, and experiences that say much more than mere words. 
We cling to this. And when I say feelings and thoughts and experiences, there's a passage in the epistle of John where he talks about there being many voices in the world. And I think I just now somewhat understood what John was trying to say. Is that there are many sources of information for us that are, we are bombarded with on a daily basis. And it can be very difficult at times to distinguish between what is your thoughts and feelings and what is being given to you. Our thoughts are indeed a tool that brings us messages but feelings, deep-seated feelings, not thoughts parading as feelings. And what I mean by that is this. We have often, like I did the other night, had a thought come, expressed it as a feeling, and then had to apologize for it. Because it wasn't really how we feel. If we want to know what our truth is, we, I believe, have to Think about it, ponder it, and say, now what is my real feeling about this? How do I really feel about it? What is my real conclusion about this? Because I believe that within each of us is a sort of DNA. As the case is with a tree, everything that the tree becomes is, in this, is inside the seed. And surely... We, as higher, elevated, sentient beings, have something, too, that guides us from within. Not all thoughts and feelings and words come from God. There have been things said and done that have nothing to do, I believe, with God at all. So what is the difference? How do we discern? I believe there are basic rules we can follow. God's communications are always the highest thought, the clearest word, the grandest feeling. Anything less or contrary is from another source. The highest thought is joy. The clearest words are truth. The grandest feeling is love. And they're interchangeable. One leads to the other. The remaining question is, Will those messages be heeded? And I'm talking about us as individuals and a collective group of sentient beings. I believe sometimes God's messages to us as a human family are not heeded because it's difficult for those of us who have embraced theologies that tell us this amorphous being has to be Worshipped and praised, it has to be appeased, it has to be satisfied, it has needs to believe that our source loves unconditionally. Because we don't do very much of that. Sometimes when it comes to our pets, we do that. Our little babies, we do that, at least when we're acting naturally, we do that. But when it comes to each other, Oh, this unconditional love thing that Jesus talked about. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who despitefully use you and love your enemies. I said to a congregation about six months ago, I said, by the way Jesus talked, we should already know he wasn't from earth. The things that he said were not a part of our popular embrace. Love your enemies? If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn the other? That is not based on human experience and looking at the historical annals the way human beings have behaved. About 98% of the time we've been on this planet, we've been involved in some kind of conflict, some kind of warfare, some kind of violence. So those words alone should tell us he's from somewhere else. He's not from around here. Sometimes I believe 
God's words to us or communications to us are simply misunderstood. Most because they're not received. Because the airwaves are clogged with so much other stuff. And we're so busy rushing to and fro. If you don't think we rush to and fro, get in your car and get on the highway. It is, it is almost scary to me some days when I'm on the highway. When you have young people and some older people riding motorcycles at 100 miles an hour down the highway. Uh, when you're driving, and I guess there isn't a slow lane anymore. There used to be a slow lane where us slow folks could go. Because people will get behind you and blow their horns because they want you to speed up. And I've actually sometimes just pulled off the road. I said, because it's not going to get in an entanglement with anybody. And if you, you just got to go, I'll let you go. I'd rather just do that. Because we know some horrific things have happened as a result of simple road rage. One of the most powerful ways that God communicates with us, and I'll do a little bit more on, and I'll come and do a, a, another section of this. But I'll do a little bit in a moment about individual communications from God. But one of the ways that God has communicated with us as a species is through our experiences. But we haven't listened to our experiences. We still think that killing people to stop them from killing works. We still think that bombing and using semi-automatic weapons is the solution to problems. We live in fear of each other, and our theologies have us in fear of our Creator. Or fear we're afraid of God. We're afraid of others. We're afraid of ourselves. We love conditionally, and we keep trying to do what doesn't work. We don't learn from our experience. And we continue to do the same things over and over and over again. Einstein enters at this point and says, you cannot use the same energy that created a problem to try to solve it. But we do. Because we don't listen to our experience. We don't see or hear our Creator communicating with us through experience. What does experience tell you? My little seedlings, what does it tell you? And because we're seedlings, because we are infants still evolving, we're very young in this massive universe that's been around for billions of years, I don't believe God has to ever forgive us for anything. Because we're seedlings. For God to punish and judge us at this stage would be like a little six-month-old baby throwing milk across the table and you taking a strap to the child. What purpose would that serve? It is through our experiences and the broad parameters that we are given that we ought to eventually internalize that experience. It's sort of like the story of the prodigal son. It says, and it's one of the most beautiful parables I think Jesus taught. He said, and he came to himself and returned home. And one day I believe our species, even if we annihilate our physical existence now, we just have to start all over again. But someday, because these messages from our Creator continue to come day in and day out through experience, through feelings, through thoughts, and through written word, we are going to be who we are here to be and true to who we are. Our first instinct is love. We're created in the likeness and image of our source. We are all connected, and those are the things we have not come to terms with yet. What goes around does come around. Life is circular. We do reap what we sow. That is why the masters tell us things like, love thy neighbor as thyself, because your neighbor is you. 
having a different experience because you're all connected to this cosmic source, this immeasurable cosmic source. And when you look in the mirror, you see a miniature version of that where all of the body parts are connected to one. We can look at trees and all kinds of examples in our experience to tell us you can be individuated but not separated. One of the simplest examples, fingers on a hand, but we have not embraced that fully yet. Now to a few personal things. God never shuts up. He's saying, preacher, you never shut up. Have you ever been in a situation, and I'll go into a little bit more detail when I come again, but I'm, I'm going I'm to close this, where you confronted a friend who had a real critical situation at hand, and suddenly this bright idea comes, and you say, I tell you what. And then a few days later, you can't even remember what it was. And somebody says to you, do you know that when you said that to him or her, it changed their whole perspective? And you have to say, what, what did I say? God communicates with us. We call it serendipity. We call it the light bulb going on. We call it intuition. We call it a number of things. But because we are so afraid of being blasphemers and saying that God speaks to or communicates with me even as I pray or meditate and that Jesus and Buddha and Muhammad and others are not the only ones that God talks to. That our Creator does not set aside one and set beside another, but communicates with all of us on a continual basis. And when we pay attention, we realize that did not come from me. It came through me. And there are so many other examples. Neil talks about a situation where his son was choking and he did everything he could to try to dislodge what was in the child's throat. And suddenly this idea came to him to hold him upside down. And it came pummeling out. And he said he went upstairs and sat on his bed and said, thank you, God. Because I couldn't figure it out. God never shuts up. We prayed prayers. And suddenly something comes to us, or suddenly something happens, because God never shuts up. He talked about another situation, where there was a young lady at his house, in a critical situation, and all of a sudden the answer pops out. And then another situation where he was traveling down a dark road. And we've had these kinds of experiences where we were about to make a turn. I had it one morning coming home from a little church I used to pastor in Tampa. And I got toward an intersection and something told me, slow down. And a car came through the red line. We've had experiences similar to that. And what I'd like for us to do is to tune in this week and maybe write down these ideas that suddenly appear or these thoughts that suddenly come or some answer to some perplexing situation and recognize the fact that these things are not so much coming from us as they're coming through us because God never shuts up and God doesn't just talk to a select few that is what our theologies and cosmologies have told us, and it was limited data. I believe that in each of us, encompassing all of us, scientists talk about these auras that they've seen around the human body, these energy fields. 
and that they're all connected. And I believe that's the imprint of the soul. It's not the soul, but it's like a signature. We're larger than our bodies. And at some point, if I get an opportunity, I'll talk about that and how if we feel that we're our bodies, life can look pretty dismal. But when we realize that we're larger than that, and that there's an agenda that our soul has, which is the reason we're here, and it has nothing to do with leaving heaven, heaven to struggle to go back. What kind of sense does that make? That God would plant us here on earth and say, Now, from your separated position, because you're all sinners and you're unworthy, work your way back to heaven. And then one religion comes along and says, no matter what you do, you can't go back unless you do this. And there's only one doorway. There's only one pathway. And how can an immeasurable creator only have one doorway to access the creator? Makes no sense. And we're in the age, someone said, of knowing where maybe the bravest thing we can do is question everything. Because it is through questioning that we get answers. And I hear Jesus saying, Ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be opened. And I refer to Jesus because he's the spiritual master we're most familiar with in the Western world. There are others. As I read this morning, there are similar teachings. God communicates with all of us all the time because God does not know how to shut up. 